So welcome everyone for this uh, lightning talk. And uh, we will have on stage Grace Janssen. She is a developer and developers advocate at IBM. And she has a background not only in programming but also in biology. So this session will be how you as developers, why you would want to pick up the reactive platform and how she thinks it also relates to bees. So welcome up on stage, stage Grace Janssen. Thanks. So hi, thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, so as has been introduced, my name is Grace Janssen and I'm a developer advocate back in the UK for IBM. So I'm here to talk to you in the next hopefully 15 minutes about reactive architecture and how it's the future of application architecture. So to look forward for application architecture, we first have to look to the past to see where we've come from. So we've evolved from what started as really small monolithic applications. Um, and I mean, that was fine when, the, when computers were the size of an entire room. But as we gained computing power and we had more services to add into our software, our applications started to grow and grow, and it snowballed. And what that meant was our applications started to become huge, ginormous, just simply incomprehensible in terms of trying to manage the code and trying to fix bugs, um, the systems would crash. So we moved on to this new form of architecture, microservices. And that was a great step forward. That allowed us to distribute out the different services that we had. It allowed us to uh, control our developments and our deployments, so we were able to deploy only parts of the application. And if we had a bug, we were able to identify that much quicker, um, and we were able to isolate that failure. But with this new form of distributed architecture comes new problems. So users nowadays have new expectations. So a user nowadays doesn't expect an application to fail, doesn't expect not to be able to access it. They expect to be able to have responses as soon as they click buttons. No user expects to go to a shopping cart to find their items disappeared because someone else bought it. So how do we kind of um, tackle these new demands and these new expectations that users put on applications? And where do we go from here in our application architecture evolution? Well, to look for inspiration, um, I used my biology background and started looking around to nature. Nature's had millennia to be able to get this right. They've evolved again and again and again to form efficient systems that do the job already. So why can't we look to nature to inspire us for our applications? So I'm going to show you a system of individuals that are all um, they all act independently, and, but they work towards a common goal. So they work towards this goal of acting as one organization, and that's bees. Yep, real life bees. So bees, as individuals, all act independently. They have different roles, they do different things for the hive, but as a whole, they act towards the common goal of making the hive successful, getting as much young, getting as much food, making a queens, making more bees, making honey that we all love and enjoy. So how do bees do this so efficiently? Well, I'm going to show you three situations, three examples of behaviors that bees do that we can copy and we want to show in our applications. So the first of those is food foraging. So bees have different roles, like I mentioned, and one of those is scouts. So food scouts and bees, they go off and find food for the colony. And when they find it, they immediately rush back to the hive and they make their way to these dance floors. Yes, bees have dedicated dance floors. So they make their way to these dance floors, and then around these dance floors, there's observer bees. And these observer bees act independently. They're all there waiting for scouts to come and tell them about the food sources. And what they do is they dance their little bottoms around, basically, and show them where the food is. So bees are incredible in this regard. So they show them how far away the food is, where the food is, how, how long it will take to get there. They can even factor in wind speed. And what they do is they try and communicate this as quickly as possible to get a fast response from the observer bees. So what the observer bees want to do is get as, as little information as they need to then quickly dash off to this food source to get the food. The quicker they can respond, the more food they'll get out of this food source. They don't want another hive coming in and stealing their food. So they've got to be responsive. They've got to be quick on the mark to get to that food source. The same can be said for when the food source runs out the last bee to come back will headbutt, literally headbutt the last bee off the dance floor. And again, the bees will respond and they'll stop. 
So bees are extremely responsive, and rightfully so, because it's important for their survival. The second example I'm going to show you is looking at what happens when the most essential member of the hive, the queen, dies. What occurs? Well, what could be a catastrophic situation isn't. Bees have this system in place where when the queen dies, the pheromone signal, so chemical signal she produces, is picked up on and it disappears. So when the queen dies, that disappears and the bees around her know that the queen has died. They don't have to have been there when she died. They know from the messages that are sent out. And what they do is they react to this and follow a set of instructions that enable them to form a new bee, to basically replace the queen. So they pick a larvae, they pick about four or five larvae that are about three days old, and they start feeding them royal jelly. And the royal jelly then means that they, they become queens. The first queen to pop out kills all the rest, as brutal as that is, and then she becomes the queen and the hive carries on. And in that in-between period, the hive is still able to continue. The hive doesn't shut down, the system doesn't crash, like, they don't stop existing. The hive continues because they know that other members of the hive are busy replacing that vital part of the hive structure, the queen. So they're extremely resilient in that regards. Even when the most important member of their hive dies, they're still able to continue. And then the last situation I'm going to show you is what happens when a beehive is under attack. So what happens when something bigger than this worm attacks? So let's say it's a bear. Well, as I said before, they have different roles, and one of those roles is a guard role. But only about 11% of a beehive are guards. So when something like a, bee attack, a, a bear attacks, 11% just isn't going to cut it. So instead, the guard bees go into the hive when they see this new threat coming, and they're able to recruit other bees. So be it nurser bees, undertaker bees, there's even air conditioning bees, and they all come and become guards instead. So that means they're really flexible in terms of what roles they fulfill. And when the need arises, when a big bear's coming at the hive, they can switch roles. They're quite dynamic in that regard, very elastic. And so they're able to switch to these new roles to tackle with the threats to the system and the, uh, the loads at the time. So they're extremely resilient in this regard. So how does this relate to software? Well, it actually relates really well to the reactive manifesto. So for those who weren't in the workshop yesterday, run by Andre, uh, it's at, or haven't heard of this before, it's a set of principles based on four cornerstones. And what it is, is it was set up by Jonas Bonner in 2013. And it's essentially a set of kind of specifications as to what behaviors our applications should have in order to deal with the demands of the users in this current um, modern era. So the first of those relates to the first example I showed you. So remember the dancing bees and their food foraging. You can see it on the left here. So the dancing bees are a great way of showing how responsive the bee system is. So as I said, as soon as that bee comes back, the observer bees collect that information and immediately dash off to get them. They're extremely responsive, and that's what we want from our applications. We want our users, as soon as they click a button, to know that they did something right, that something's happening in the background, something's being computed. We don't want to leave them in the dark, busy clicking away, because they have no idea something's happening. We want our acts to be responsive. The second thing I want to talk to you about is the second cornerstone. So that relates to the last example I showed, just at the top. So it's to do with the guards. So I explained how bees are really great at being able to switch roles. They're really flexible. They're really elastic in that regard. They're able to utilize their limited resources, so in that regards, the number of bees, effectively. So instead of going and getting another hive to come join in, they're able to reallocate their resources. And that's what we want from applications. We want our applications to be elastic in terms of their, their resource allocation. So if I've got hundreds of users trying to log in to my, let's say, restaurant app, but I've got no one trying to book a table, then why aren't I using the resources from my table service and putting it back into my login service? So why aren't I reallocating those resources? It's much more cost efficient that way. Um, we don't have to completely buy new servers. We can use the resources we've already paid for and already have. The last one relates to the, uh, the, the second example I gave you, where really, really sadly, the queen dies. So what happens when you have this, what could be a catastrophic situation, because the most important member has died? Well, you're resilient to it. So what we want to do is we want to be able to do what the bees do. So we want to monitor our systems to be able to know when that vital piece of our software has gone down to be able to replace it, 
to bring up a new version of her, in this case, the queen. So we want our applications to be resilient. So we want responsiveness, elastic elasticity, and resiliency. But how do we achieve that? Well, the same way bees do. All of this is underpinned, if you can guess from the picture, by messages. Bees are able to communicate not just with each other, one to one, but they're able to communicate with multiple bees at the same time, and that they don't require necessarily a response. It's all about asynchronous messaging, so having that asynchronous communication between the bees. So a key example was that dancer. So when the dancer came back, when the dancer came back to the hive and danced on that dance floor, the dancer didn't necessarily need a response from the rest of the bees around her. They knew that they were going to respond and they were going to go get that food as soon as they had the information they needed. The same thing can be said for the elasticity example. So the guard bees don't go in and ask, can you become a guard, please, and wait for a response. They send out the alarm, and they know that bees are going to come and become guards for them. The same can be said in applications. That's what we want to achieve. We want to be able to communicate asynchronously between applications and stop blocking each other. So why is this all important? Why do you care about all of this? Well, reactive application is pretty much what we're looking forward to in the future. So is reactive app architecture the way forward for application architecture? Well, if bees have been perfecting it for millennia and they've become this efficient, almost simplistic system, then why aren't we copying this in our applications? We want the same behaviors as bees. We want the same outcomes as bees. We want to be as efficient as possible. We want to utilize our resources effectively. So why aren't we looking at reactive application? Well, in order to do that, we need more people to understand about it. We need more people to be interested in this form of architecture. So what I'm asking you guys to do after this session, hopefully, is to go away and research about how you guys can make your applications more reactive. How can you utilize the free resources out there in order to meet these new user demands? So I put up a few useful links. Um, these are just a couple of the tons of resources out there that you can use to learn more about reactive architecture. So I put up the reactive manifesto. So take a look at that if I didn't explain it in enough detail. There's also, re there's also links to free resources. So we've got the, uh, the frameworks and toolkits that you can use, so Acker, Legom. Uh, there's also a couple of blogs that explain why, in more detail, you'd want to use reactive architecture um, and how to do it. So how do you get your application from um, the normal mi like a monolith to microservices and then to reactive microservices? So hopefully that will give you more of an idea. And hopefully I've sparked an interest in you and made you think about how you can develop your applications forward into the future of architecture. Thanks very much. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I'll be at the IBM booth for the rest of the weekend. Thanks.